well, it's okay. Well, good morning, afternoon and evening. My name is Lucia Roberna and I warmly welcome you to this event on behalf of the ANOVA. I would like to thank our co-sponsors, Italy, the Croatian Institute of Public Health, Pompidou Group, Asociación Proyecto Hombre and San Patriñano Foundation for its involvement in the organization of the event. As per the technical details to indicate that this event is being recorded and that we will share with you the link of the video afterwards. Please add your comments and questions to the general chat and the Q&A section chat. Children whose parents use drugs have been seen as an invisible population because these children experience a wide range of feelings and situations that are usually buried in silence because of shame, stigma, and lack of information and resources to seek help. At the same time, parents face the double challenge of parenthood and drug dependence, also lacking sufficient information on where to find support or living with the fear that their children will be taken away from them if they disclose their drug dependence. As a result, they tend to delay seeking help while drug problem becomes more and more central to the family dynamics. And this is even more true for women who face gender-based stigma in addition to increased barriers to access treatment. Today's event comes with excellent speakers that will discuss how to develop holistic interventions that target families and children together from a human rights perspective and will show some good examples and good practices and recommendations. I'm glad to see that this topic is gaining visibility at the CND through inclusions at certain resolutions like the one on early, uh, early prevention and organization of side events concerning the situation of children. So I will now pass the word and moderation to Florence Mabillet from the Pompidou Group to kick off this important conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lu Lucia. Thank you, uh, and uh, welcome to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. And I'm very pleased uh, to be here with you. I'm very pleased that we have so many people uh, attending. I'm thanking also the countries and organizations who are participating in this event. And uh, I am thanking Dianova to give me the opportunity to moderate this event. Uh, just a few words about the Pompidou Group, the organization I belong to. It is an enlarged partial agreement of the Council of Europe, and it allows us to work with countries not only in Europe, but also uh, in Mexico, in Morocco and Israel, which are members countries. Through the cooperation uh, with our 42 countries, we can exchange and knowledge and good practice on uh, drug policies and always focusing, trying to focus on human rights. So last year, uh, we celebrated our 50th anniversary and we extended our mandate to um, addictive behaviors related to illicit substances, such as alcohol and tobacco, and also new forms of addiction, such as internet gambling. We also adopted a new name, and we are now the Council of Europe International Cooperation Group on Drugs and Addiction. This year, 2021, so last year, was a very important one because it marked the launch of a new project concerning the children whose parents, parents use drugs. And uh, our work started following an invitation to the Pompidou Group Secretariat to participate in the discussions by the Council of Europe on elaborating a new strategy on the rights of the child. And what happened is that when I participate in these discussions, I noticed that the, the children whose parents use drugs were not uh, appearing in the category of vulnerable children, which was to appear in the child's strategy. And this topic is uh, very dear to me, to me, this topic of children and families uh, affected by uh, parental use is dear to me because these children tend to be forgotten in some places and visibilized. They are sometimes to grow in a difficult uh, situation with uh, facing disadvantages and they have to face obstacles and they have to be resilient to sometimes um, possible adverse conditions. 
we will see all of that today with our uh, brilliant uh, um, speakers. And uh, it's my pleasure to invite in the first place, Corina Giacomello, who is our consultant for our project. Corina is Italian. She's a pro living in uh, Mexico. She's professor at the Autonomous uh, uh, University of Chapias. And I had the chance to meet um, Corina several times in the field of gender, but from gender to children, the link is natural to establish. So, uh, Corinna, the floor is yours, please. And you have, have a PowerPoint. Yes, where yes, you I will will present it. the project. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Uh, let me share my screen. Et voila. Can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay. So, uh, good morning from Mexico City. Good afternoon. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you to the Pompidou Group, Italy. Croatia, Dianova, um, Ireland for the invitation to this event. So I am the uh, fortunate Pompidou Group consultant for this project, which I'm going to present now very briefly, Children Whose Parents Use Drugs. This is a human rights based project and uh, focuses on children that live in families affected by drug dependence and also on the services that look at families and children from a children perspective and a women rights perspective. So programs and practices that help protect in childhood and guaranteeing children's needs while at the same time addressing parents. So we look at three things in this project. On the one hand, what children experiences, feelings such as shame, anxiety, fear, the fear of speaking out, of seeking help, of not understanding what's going on, of blaming themselves for what's happening in their families. On the other hand, the parents who struggle with the dual challenges of being a parent which is a difficult task per se. And on the other hand, also to be struggling with drug dependence and their personal history and their personal traumas. And then we look at services as what, what's available in national countries and also at the local level through NGOs and social services. So this is what the project focuses on. And uh, it's part of the Pompidou Group's mandate to uh, look at human rights issues in drug policies and to develop proposals to that end. The project has been developing through three phases. Between November 2020 and December 2021, we developed the first two phases to which participated the 16 countries in total. We developed the three reports. All the material is available in this page, which I would then put in the chat in case you want to consult all the materials that have been published. One publication will be soon ready as an ISBN in a couple of weeks. In the last report, we collected 29 practices from 11 countries, which go from data gathering, services targeted at children, drug treatment services for women, drug treatment services that take children into account, national strategies such as the hidden harm and so on. And all the people participating in this side event were part of this big effort. We had Croatia, we had Ireland, we had San Patrignano and other Italian experiences. And that's another of the things that this project has been able to create. Uh, cooperation between countries, interchange exchanging between NGOs at the national and local level and at the international level. So it's a project that's created a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of sharing between countries and actors and that's part of course of its aims. And we also included in the last, uh, in, in the second phase between February and December 2021, interviews with women and children, which will constitute the backbone of this year project. So in February, we started the phase three of the project. We have 13 countries participating. Of course, we have Croatia, Ireland, and Italy, among others. We have Mexico, North Macedonia. You can see the whole list on the screen. And what we will do is to follow up policies and programs. So again, to look at what's being done at the national and local level, addressing families, children, and drug-related issues. But also we will include interviews and discussion groups with women and children as stakeholders, as experts. So last year, we focused on services. We, we gather information on what's being done, on what's, occur, on what's happening on the ground. But this year, we want to listen to women and children directly affected by this problem, but also by, by state interventions, and ask them what works, what do you need, what else can be done, what would you recommend to other children and to other women and services working with these populations. 
Now I would like to focus in my last, I don't know, maybe three minutes on some of the recommendations we developed in last year's last report. Of course, I'm not going to read everything because it's, it, it will go beyond the time. And of course, I want to respect my colleagues' time. So we'll only read the main message and then all these recommendations can be consulted in the page that I showed to you and that I will share again uh, later in the chat. So we have a four axes of proposals. The first one concerns children and the need to develop wrap up strategies to, uh, that, that, that include all children. So basically to make sure that children who have the specific vulnerability of parental drug use are properly identified and addressed within the group of children living with uh, families affected by multiple vulnerabilities. So we need services to speak to each other and not to work in silos, which is the current situation. We need people working in the field of child protection and so social services to be aware and not to be afraid of drug addiction related issues. But we also need to provide the children with spaces where they can share what's going on and where they can receive information on how to seek help. Then we also need to improve the way data is not only collected, but also shared. This recommendation refers to an international indicator, which is the treatment demand indicator. So basically the suggestion to member states is, let's not only ask if people accessing treatment have children and if they live with them, but let's dig in more into what the situation of their children. And we have a fantastic example from Ireland on how to do it. But then there's also the recommendation for countries to better engage in data sharing between ministries and agencies. Data is there. Most of the time data is available, but it's not necessarily integrated and used to inform public policies. Then the third act of intervention is with regards to drug treatment services and particularly the need to make sure that parents, especially women with children, have places where they can go to. So on the one hand, we need to have available services such as day crash or day centers so that parents do not have the barrier of taking care of their children not to access treatment. We also need to provide intensive outpatient care for parents so that they can go to treatment without having to go to a residential community. And then, and that's my last slide, super important to address women who use drugs and women who are victims and survivors of violence. So to make sure that we have uh, uh, that we have available uh, women-only, trauma-informed, non-stigmatizing, gender-responsive inpatient and outpatient services where women can go with their children. Also to make sure that shelters um, for women who are victims of violence accept women who use drugs. That's not the rule yet, it's quite the exception. And we have the case of Ireland and Cyprus in our report. And finally, again, make sure that women have the opportunity to speak, to be taken into account and to have spaces where they can share what they're going through and what they need from services. So this is it. Thank you again for the opportunity to present this project. Uh, thank you, Corina, and thank you for respecting your time. Very good. I'm very happy. Uh, last year, when we started this project, it was a kind of a challenge. We didn't know at all whether uh, the countries would be interested in the topic and whether they would be ready to share that practice and improve their practice. And we have done that. Uh, we have seen that it, they, they were really, really committed. We have seen a lo lot of exchange in between countries. It will continue this year, what I also like in this, this year project is that we are going to follow up what the countries have uh, um, spoken about last year. And also this time we are going to give a floor to the women and to the children. So the, the ones who are very, very much concerned in the first place. So thank you very much. So now it's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Yadianka um, Zimik from Zagreb. And uh, Yadranka also participates in our project. And uh, Yadranka is um, has studied the social work, and she's a, a doctor of, in the social sciences. She's um, she has been working in the field of addiction for 21 years, and she's currently working in the service for combating drug abuse of the Croatian Institute of Public Health. So uh, Yadranka, the floor is yours, and you are going to present your, the experience of Croatia in uh, providing care for children whose parents take uh, drugs. 
Uh, thank you very much, Florence. I am very happy because I uh, can be part of this very important side event on a very important uh, topic. I think uh, uh, these children is, uh, uh, is, must be in the future, uh, 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 in the focus in each uh, uh, each uh, national uh, policy, spe uh, especially if uh, uh, this policy aim to drugs. I would uh, like to say something about Croatian experience is providing care uh, for uh, those uh, children and uh, challenges who, who bit, uh, uh, with this uh, we face it. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the Republic of Croatia, in drug uh, policy, uh, we are uh, no uh, differences between uh, this uh, target group and other uh, other uh, children's children uh, in the risk. Measure for children of parents who use drugs have been implemented within health and social care as standard operative measure in ordinary uh, work. Uh, applicable measures for parents with addiction are stated in the family law and social welfare legislation. And uh, this uh, uh, law include measures like uh, injuring professional assistance and support in the realization of, of uh, child color. And some, in some case, it's uh, possible that uh, uh, during uh, uh, this uh, uh, law uh, make separation from the family, but it's not intention from this and the intention is enhance uh, uh, parents uh, skill of uh, a person who use drug. Uh, as regards family prisoners, Croatia has well uh, regulated uh, legislation and well established practice uh, for family prisoners who have underage children or give birth during the stay in prison where the child can stay with their mother until free age. If we uh, can description of uh, uh, this uh, group of uh, children and their families, we can uh, 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 say some, uh, some the fact. The fact that both parents or one parent is person who with an addiction does not condition the restriction of parental rights. However, it does require effective supervision by the social welfare system and effective cooperation among a health system. If we see some uh, short data, uh, of all persons treated in uh, 2019, uh, data show that by parental status, 38% uh, of them have uh, children. Significant higher number of women addicted to drugs are parents and very high percentage of them lives with, uh, with their children. In contrast, when uh, children uh, uh, whose parents or both parents are addicted to drug, uh, they, in these cases, uh, more likely they, uh, these uh, children not live with their parents and be separated from them, usually living with uh, grandparents, families, and some, uh, sometimes in foster families or institutions. Uh, one group of children has uh, internalized problems such as fear, uh, timidity, depression, and social uh, withdrawal, while others have active behavior such as resistance to authority, impulsivity, hyperactivity, aggression. Uh, it's very important to say that some of these children do not any uh, behavioral problems, especially if they live in family where their parents stable in the, in the treatment or have uh, successful, uh, successfully recovered. recovered. Uh, next slide, please. If we say some, uh, something about uh, preventive programs, uh, 
we think that is uh, this program it's not in, enough in croatia especially it's uh, just few programs in uh, healthy system uh, which uh, involving very often women uh, with uh, underage children uh, most experts agree that children whose one or both parents are addicts can be at high risk for exposure to negative phenomena, uh, especially uh, such as abuse and neglect, and therefore at risk for developing behavioral problems during all stages of psychosocial uh, development. Uh, um, creating special. Yadianka, you have one minute left. Please. Okay, creating special <laughs> prevention programs for only for this group can be WH sport. And if we uh, think uh, it's more important to work to continue connection and cooperation between the health and welfare systems with special emphasis on their cooperation in providing care for women with uh, addiction and at the time of childbirth. E, given the fact, according to parental status, a significant uh, percentage of people treated for drug addiction who have underage children are mostly mother, it is necessary to design uh, psychosocial treatment programs for women with underage children, which will include uh, the possibility of children in residential treatment centers. Uh, this, uh, you have my presentation. I would uh, uh, like to thank you because you invite me. And if you have some question, I uh, I be very happy if I can answer it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yadranka. Thank you for sharing your experience in uh, Croatia. Um, Thank you for under, underlining that uh, the fact that uh, both parents or, or one parent is a person with an addiction does not condition the restriction of parental rights, and this is a fundamental. Uh, also, um, for, uh, concerning the, the preventing programs, also alerting us that uh, if we, the fact that uh, we could tend to create spe specific prevention programs only for this group of children, this could be a double edged sword and this could be uh, risky and it could indirectly st uh, stigmatize uh, the child. Uh, and in the end, I will also retain and um, keep in mind the fact that uh, what is key is the cooperation between the welfare and the healthcare system, and that uh, it is very important to be able to set up uh, protocols between uh, the two different fields. And I know that you have been in contact, for example, with the Cyprus in order to exchange uh, their experience on this topic. So thank you very much, and thank you for the work you are doing uh, with us. Now it is uh, an honor uh, to present uh, uh, Catherine Komiski from Ireland. And Catherine is with us today when it is St. Patrick's Day. So that shows a very uh, devotion to us, to our work. So Catherine is uh, the, the chair of the scientific committee of the MCDDA. And she's also uh, appointed uh, uh, by a minister as an expert to the Irish National Drug Strategy. And Catherine has written a number of books on the topic of addiction. So Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's share the screen. Can you see that? Um, yes, it's coming. Great, thank you. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and an honor to be among such great ladies. <laughs> so thank you so much, Florence and Diavina. Uh, so I would like to talk to you today about some work we've been doing on prevalence. So I suppose the first question is, you know, how big is this problem? How many children are affected? How many parents? So I would like to talk to you a little bit about that. And I would like my slides and my talk to be useful to you. So I have focused on providing you with resources that maybe you can take away and use in your own service or in policy environment. So first of all, I would like to... Um, just talk about prevalence. 
So we're going to give a little bit about prevalence and how you may estimate prevalence for your own region to see how big is this problem so that you can look for extra resources, perhaps. Uh, looking at some of the risk and protective factors through a new EMCDA uh, background paper that was commissioned and they asked me to do. So we'll look at that. And then if you want to introduce an effective program, what are the features of effective programs? As opposed to this, the program we like, what are features of effective programs for parents and children? Um, and finally, where can I find out about programs? There is a registry of programs that have been evaluated that you can check. And then finally, a little bit about where can we learn more? How can I continue my professional development? Where can I send my staff, my volunteers, my outreach workers and so forth for some free training? So I'll try and do all of that in six minutes. <laughs> So I won't go into the details of the background uh, to our prevalence work, but this was done with Dr. Karen Galligan, who I see is in the audience today as part of her PhD, and where we used the EMCDA recommended method of very simple method, the benchmark multiplier method, and we have... Uh, provided a paper on that step by step, we call it a 12 step process. So Karen and I have provided a paper on that where you can do similar in your region, where you can maybe get together with a few local services and say, let's see how big is this problem so that we can quantify it and we can then look for resources for this problem. From our work with Karen Galligan and myself, we found in one particular area that we were working with, in an urban disadvantaged area of uh, South Dublin, we found that for every person known to an addiction service in that region, there was just one under, under one child. So, we, so if you have 10,000 people on your books, then we're saying there are 10,000, just under 10,000 children in that region as well. So this is give you some idea of the hidden scale of this problem. Uh, and as I say, that was our estimate for this particular region, but it gave us a first minimum estimate of the number of children in this region. We then said, right, so now we know the scale of the problem. What are the risk and protective factors? What do we need to be looking at? And I really liked there that uh, Jadranka said, you know, not all children will have problems. It depends upon the family circumstances, whether there's two parents using substances and the role of the grandmother we also found was really, really important as well. So in terms of the risk and protective factors, again, they're not uniform across the age of the child. So in this new work that's just been published this week by the EMCDA, uh, you can, it's available online, we've actually looked at the risk and protective factors across the ages. So for example, if you have a very young population and young children, maybe you need to be looking at, are these children being immunized? Are they being vaccinated? If you have children of an older age, maybe early teens, are they at risk of um, uh, early uh, sexualization? So there's different risks depending upon the age group. And again, looking within your region, what would be your priority uh, given these different risks? So again, there's some information in there that you can take a look at to stimulate you to start thinking about what do we need to address in this region? Then you might say, OK, we now know we're working with maybe school children or preschool children, perhaps. And then you're saying, well, what are effective programs? So there has been some work and I've done a review of reviews and looked at this for the MCDA. And we found that what are the features of effective programs? What should I be looking for if I'm going to bring in a program for these children and where what? The literature is saying is that where both children and parents are involved and where the program is of a sufficient duration, not just a short program for a mother or a father, but actually programs that target families and are of at least 10 weeks uh, duration. But there are, um, you know, limitations because there still isn't enough data. And furthermore, in terms of effective pro 
what other features are important intensive case management so where you can uh, work intensively with a family at the family level and again remember the importance of the grandparents here as we saw uh, previously so it's family level uh, interventions intensive and these seem to offer the most promise so again it's this ecological framework around a family it's not just the the child who is at the center but it's the parent it's maybe the could be an aunt or a sister who's minding the children uh who's you know making the dinner it's this wrap around the family is important where can you find a program that works so again the emcda have a registry uh where they have looked at programs, they've looked at the evidence, and you can search that registry for an effective program. So you can see here on the slide, you could search maybe within a school setting, what sort of age group are you looking at for teenagers, or are you looking for preschool ages, and what are you looking at maybe, you know, um, different risk factors. So there is a registry of programs that have been externally and independently evaluated that you can say right this program i know is works if i implement it as it's designed and then finally the uh where can you go for further training uh we've developed my team in trinity college have developed with uh, nurses uh, midwives outreach workers um from south africa from ireland from europe states we have developed a free free <laughs> MOOC massive open online course we've had over mm -hmm. 1700 people do this course in the last three months and we have videos there of how to perform a brief intervention how to perform a naloxone uh, if the overdose we have little snippets of the best practice in the evidence we have interviews with midwives who are working um with people in very resource poor settings uh, on best practice. And this is free. And this is somewhere where you can send your team if you're interested in knowing and learning more. Here's some selected references. And I'm very happy to talk to anybody. I'm on Twitter. A lot of the resources are on Twitter as well. If you want to get in touch, I'm very happy to share these freely available resources. So thank you, Florence. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I've, Thank, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And uh, the worries that you had at the start that uh, your presentation should be useful are totally lifted. It was totally <laughs> useful. So thank, thank you very much. And uh, uh, to give uh, all uh, in uh, such a short time so many so many information, and uh, especially also the last part on the MOOC that I didn't know and uh, that I could use also Great. for uh, working with uh, countries in uh, other area of the world. So thank you very much. And uh, now I will um, give the floor to um, Gisela Hansen, uh, who is the director of Dianova in Spain. So uh, Gisela is a clinical psychologist and uh, it's my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning or afternoon. Uh, First of all, thank you for, for inviting me. This is a huge pleasure to share uh, with that, this panelist. I mean, I'm hearing all the intervention and it's amazing, so interesting. So let me share my screen. Um, just one second, okay. So I'm going to focus my intervention in addressing the rights of children who parents who struck at the addiction service level, more treatment level and harm reduction. Uh, services. Uh, first of all, I would like to in very briefly introduce the Dianova network. We Dianova network counts with 22 members operating in 19 different countries. We specifically work with social and sanitary projects in those different countries and specifically with addiction treatment. So uh, addressing rights in general and addressing children's rights in uh, drug treatment and harm reduction services specifically. So we consider that the situation of children, of people who use drugs, has not received the attention it deserves. Many issues have yet to be addressed, like um, implementation, design, implementation of a children's rights perspective in addiction services, the design of specific prevention programs, or the need for better cooperation between services, among others. Um, 
we consider that a very huge effort has been made to mainstream gender perspective, and this is uh, great. And there's still a long way to go in order to really mainstream gender perspective in, in drug treatment. But uh, we consider that there's not the same visibility for children's rights in, in the design and implementation for, for treatment in the addiction field. So when talking about childhood, youth, and addiction, it focuses more on prevention, universal prevention, selective prevention, or youth drug, youth drug use, sorry. And not that much with the kids of those parents who are using drugs at the moment. So we identified that there is a huge gap, uh, specifically in Spain, in, their, in Italy, Spain, in, in the country that we are currently doing our interviews. Um, there's a huge gap in addressing the specific needs of children and youth whose parity is wrong, but the question is why? Why there is such a big gap on that? Um, from the end of we wanted to contribute a little bit to opening this debate. Uh, we carry out a survey to gather information on how children's needs are or are not addressed in addiction services oriented to adults, to grown-ups. Out of the 39 people from 13 different countries that answered the survey, most responded to directors or coordinators, so they are very involved in the design or implementation of those services. Um, participants provide information about service users in outpatient residential treatment, as well as in harm reduction services, because we have a very wide different kind of services that participate. Us. Um, as a result, um, we obtain very interesting conclusions, and you can um, actually download the completed study from our website. And um, as a result as well, we create an infographics, a very specific and a short infographic, uh, with the goal to create a guide, a very short guide for addiction services. What does it mean to mainstream child's perspective uh, in, in, in design and implementation of those services? So um, there's um, maybe my screen. Okay, I moved it in that. This is the okay, the structures of the infographic. You can download it well at the web page. Um, but I'm going to focus on three dimensions related with the drug treatment and harm reduction services. So what do we find? Um, the thing is that there is a huge challenge for staff, for professional staff, in order to protect children from violations of their rights and at the same time supporting their parents in treatment. This is very tricky and this is very complicated uh, sometimes. So addiction professionals can be reluctant to inquire about their, their kids, their beneficiary children, and this can be due to their fear of damaging their therapeutic relationship with parents, or maybe being subject to potential retaliation um, if, they, you know, if they report the situation, or maybe the lack of training in this field or they believe sometimes that they should primarily focus on the drug problems, on the adults' problems, and that's it. Um, also, um, there is a need to mainstream in the gender perspective in addiction services, uh, which is a long way to go now. You mentioned it before, I'm going to stop very much, but you know, prejudices among addiction professionals persist, and this is a reality, and we need to revise it. We need to overcome this stereotype that is still remaining, you know, interventions in psychological intervention and all other. And developing a gender-based perspective in addiction services can help to protect and promote the right of children better as well. It's not only about identifying violations of children's rights, it's also about responding quickly and efficiently to these violations. While many addiction professionals have been trained to assess the risk, too few initiatives are taken to promote the protection of children, at least in the countries that we study. And faced with a situation of child maltreatment, professionals may be reluctant to react due to their fear to reactions of those involved. Um, last but not least, we create a very short list of the way forward. What, what do we need to do in, in this short guide that I mentioned before? So we consider that we need to consider the children's rights perspective in adult addiction services in terms of design and implementation. Also, we need to improve the training and the supervision of professionals, uh, give them some tools to work in order to mainstream those rights, establish parenting support as a core aspect of the treatment plan, include data, data collection, include the kids in this data collection, uh, consider stigma as a leading cause of parents' reluctance to talk about their children, find appropriate strategies and avoid 
totally stigmatizing intervention. Based all attempts to improve families and children's situation on the empowerment of individuals, families, and communities, because now is this high time to focus on the rights of children in addiction treatment and harm reduction services. Thank you very much. I have to respect my six minutes. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you, Gisela. <laughs> it, it was um, again a very good um, intervention presentation, a very useful to me about the, the guide that you are preparing uh, and um, different tools, and the link also with the how to introduce a gender dimension in treatment without not forgetting the children. So uh, I think it's the direction also. Pompey the group is trying to to go to. So thank you very much for your contribution. Now our last speaker uh, and uh, will be um, Monica Bazanti uh, from San Patriano, uh, and uh, we will present the experiences from uh, Italy concerning children and uh, and uh, families. And uh, Monica has been uh, working in uh, San, with San Patriano for uh, a very long time, 1979, and um, she has a great expertise in the field of addiction. So Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Florence. Thank you very much. I, I start sharing my screen. Here you are. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Oh, what happened? So first I want to thank Dianova for inviting me and a special thanks to Florence and Pompidou Group for promoting research and studies on this area, uh, which I would say using a word that fit in the, in the topic <laughs> is a neglected area from policies and also services. On this regard, we have to uh, see underlined to, uh, to note that foster care and adoption are the most used and standard intervention in case of children uh, living in families affected by drug use. And this is, um, these are not good options because actually uh, foster care is considered an adverse childhood experience and a further trauma to children who, has or, who are already traumatized and can lead in later later in life to develop in turn uh, uh, substance use disorder. So it is necessary to find a different option, different solution. For this reason, the Italian Minister of Welfare and Labor in association with the University of Padua uh, elaborated this uh, program, PP, which is the Italian acronym for Program of Intervention to prevent the institutionalization, which means the out of placement of children uh, from a family with vulnerabilities. But it's also inspired to Pippi, the uh, famous protagonist of the Swedish novel, which is so resilient in front of any difficulties. And actually Pippi is what is looking for in, in uh, families and children to build on their strength and to find resilience in them. So this project has been going on since uh, 2011. And then in 2017, uh, the intervention with children and families in vulnerable condition national guidelines were published uh, on the basis of the field testing of the project within the Italian region and the local units. Now PP is uh, founded as an essential level of social provision, which means that all those families that need this kind of support can access to this approach for free and the project has to be implemented by the local services. This program has some innovative features, is very uh, articulated, but I, I want to focus on two specific uh, innovative features which is the integrated work in a multidisciplinary team. I would say multi stakeholder team because it is composed by many services, not only child protection, but mental health, 
uh, dependents, services, and the other members of the civil society, um, included school, included parent organization, family living in the neighborhood of the family in need. So to create a network that really can wrap up the family with and helping support. And also the program include a special training for professionals which are involved that we have seen it's very important because many professionals are not uh, trained for these specific needs. The other important, very important feature is the use of the world of the child tool, which is a tool that uh, um, allow families and children to assess their needs, their gaps, and commit to through micro project to reach some small specific goals in order to increase the capacity of the family to meet the needs of the child, to understand, become aware of this need and try to meet this need. This is called the participatory and transformative assessment method that focus on the strength of the family that rather than on their weakness and accompany the family towards an awareness that can transform and change the life of this family all around the children, or all around the child. It is based on different toolkits. One is home and community-based education and educator can uh, uh, go to the family and help within the, the family environment. There are a group of parents and children that can raise awareness of the parents around the children needs. There is the solidarity neighbors in which families and parent organization can support the family toward the autonomy. And also the school family service partnership in which this partnership between these three elements can help to make the child experience good experience within school, with his friends, so that this good experience of the child can also affect positively the life of the family and increase and improve the quality of life. But sometimes this can not be uh, sufficient. Sometimes um, it might be necessary to have family uh, in, in a residential treatment. In Italy, we have- Monica, 30... one, one more minute, please. Yeah, I, I have finished. In Italy, Thank we you. have 35, uh, uh, around 35, a center for women and uh, children or family and children. And uh, at San Patrignano, we started since 1978 to welcome children and, uh, and mothers. And we, uh, through the years, equipped ourselves with specific uh, equipment to, to meet their needs. There is dedicated set housing, trauma-informed approach, parenting program to improve the skill, after school facilities so that women and families can access vocational training in order to be able to improve their job skill and reintegrate into society, which is an integral part of the recovery process. So I think it is very important to address this need in an holistic um, way and focuses especially on the strength of these people because uh, stigma and self-stigma has already created a huge uh, void within this mother that feel unable to face their children's needs. So it is important to help them to believe in themselves one more time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Monica, and thank you for uh, ending your presentation with these uh, words that. Um, it is important uh, to really uh, count on the strength of the people who have experienced it, experienced um, difficult times and uh, that really to trust them in their possibility uh, to, uh, to do better. And now I would like to thank all of you uh, for all the speakers who have managed to, to give us in a nutshell everything, uh, what they are doing. And uh, I think they have also given us the, the desire to continue to work in this field. And it's uh, very important. I would 
would like to share with you some good news. We don't have so many at the moment in the world, but I'm happy to tell you that uh, the Council of Europe uh, strategy on the rights of a child uh, was adopted in, uh, in February by the Committee of Ministers and that it will be um, launched in, uh, in Rome in, uh, in April. And uh, what is new with this strategy, although we are, is that uh, they, the strategy contains uh, different objectives and one of them is the equal opportunities and social inclusion for all children. This, um, uh, this objective corresponds to the uh, uh, sustainable development uh, goal, which is a target to contribute to fight uh, inequality uh, affecting children. And within this uh, objective, the children of parents who use drugs have been included. So that means that we have been earned, that through the work of all of you, uh, it has been finally inclu been included into the uh, Council of Europe fourth strategy on the rights of a child. That also means that uh, uh, the countries which so far were not uh, or didn't see the issue with the children might, might start to look at it. And uh, so it's thanks to you, thanks to uh, your, our, your work. So thank you very much. And last thing, you will, as um, Corinna said, find our publication uh, on the children of parents who use drugs coming very very soon in the couple of weeks on our website. Please also register with Pompidou Group website because we have other publications coming, especially also in the field of the gender and drugs. And uh, I wish that we can meet sometimes in real life. So thank you very much. And the photo was taken before, so it is closed. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank for you. Us. Thank you to Bye. everybody for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Family time now. Bye. Yes. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye.